Good morning. You're all very welcome to worship in Port Rush this morning. It's lovely to see you gathered in here uh, to worship, and uh, it's lovely to be able to welcome those who are watching with us online and worshiping with us online, not simply consuming content, but entering into the worship experience. So we're glad that you were able to join us, that those online are able to join us. And I suspect that we have some visitors here in church today. I want you to know that you're very welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, and we would invite you to stay behind for a few minutes and enjoy a cup of tea uh, down in the welcome area uh, after the service. I want to make a quick start because we have a number of announcements to get through today. And I uh, want to just let you have the opportunity to absorb them and still have time to worship. Um, two quick things. Uh, our, our missionary prayer meeting will take place this evening after the evening service. I have noticed that the missionary prayer meetings are really well attended, and I want to commend you on that and to encourage you to maintain that, that level of engagement with the challenge to be a missionary church, uh, not only active here uh, in this community of Port Rush, but throughout the world. So that takes place, the missionary prayer meeting, uh, this evening after the evening service. And then on Monday, um, the, the finance and staffing subcommittee and the property subcommittee uh, will be meeting at, ha at 7 and 7.30 respectively uh, by Zoom. So on Zoom at 7 o'clock, the Finance and Staffing Committee, and then on Zoom at half past 7, the Property uh, Subcommittee meeting. There are other announcements in the announcement sheet. You can pick those up um, and uh, have a good look at those. Uh, but the main thing that I want to say to you this morning um, is that Port Rush has been granted leave to call a new minister. Uh, and so we're moving down the process uh, of filling the vacancy here in Port Rush. Uh, that's a key step uh, on the journey. And we're delighted that that went through um, without any challenge or difficulty at all. And in the light of the fact that, that we now have leave to call, there are a couple of important things that we need to just focus on. Uh, and the first is to um, invite you all to a, a congregational prayer meeting uh, uh, at uh, 3.16. Uh, at half past seven on Wednesday. We recognize that God is the giver of all good gifts, uh, and we recognize that God uh, responds to our prayers, uh, and so we want to come to in prayer asking him for the gift of a new minister here for Port Rush. Uh, I know that the prospect uh, of a congregational prayer meeting might be a wee bit um, intimidating for some people. Um, you might be worried that you might be a bit embarrassed, or you wouldn't know what to do, uh, or you might free, feel awkward. I understand all those things, uh, uh, but I still want to invite you to that, and indeed in encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, as we know from our reading of scripture, at every challenging situation in the life of the early church, the people of God came together to pray. So I want to encourage you to come together as a congregation and pray about the vacancy uh, in Port Rice. I know that many of you have been doing that individually, and you've been doing that in your home groups and in other um, contexts. Uh, but we want to have a congregational meeting where it's clear that we're all coming together uh, as a body of God's people here in Port Rice to seek God's help. Uh, for the filling of the vacancy. So that meeting has been arranged for half past seven at 3.16, and uh, that's going to uh, replace the home group program uh, this week, but it's not just for home group members, it's for us all. If you're anxious about that or you have questions about that, please speak to me or to John Gillespie or one of the elders, uh, um, and we'll do our best to, to make that as clear as possible what we're trying to do. We believe that God answers prayer. We believe that God commands us to pray. Uh, and so we want to respond to the, uh, with that knowledge uh, in an active step uh, of obedience. So that's Wednesday at half past seven uh, in 316. Uh, and then in relation to the vacancy, there are a couple of administrative um, matters that have to be sorted out. Um, and I have some announcements then just to make you aware of those. The first is in relation to a voters list. Kirk Session uh, and, and the Vacancy Commission are currently uh, in the process uh, of preparing a list of voters who will be eligible to vote in the election of the new minister. A draft list giving names and addresses of those believed to be eligible voters will be, display, will be displayed down in the welcome area from next Sunday uh, for two weeks. Please check that list and see if you're on it and you think you should be on it, then that's a good thing. Uh, if you're on it and you don't think you should be on it, then raise the issue with John Gillespie or myself. If you're not on it and you think that you should be on it, please speak to John Gillespie or myself. What we're trying to do is to have a voters list which accurately represents uh, the voting members of this congregation. And we want to have that in good time, all prepared, so that when the election for a new minister um, is held, all those who are eligible to vote will be able to vote. Uh, and 
if you have a look at that list, um, see if there are any issues with it, bring it to our attention and as soon as you can. That would be really helpful. And just so that you know, voting members of the church are people on the communion roll uh, uh, who are listed by name and, uh, or number uh, and who have contributed to stipend or free will offering uh, in the last financial year. So the two key aspects that you're looking for, um, you need to be on the communion roll and you need to have contributed to the stipend or free will offering scheme during the past financial year. There are some other exceptions to those rules which are a wee bit too complicated for me to read out, but they will be displayed on the notice board in the welcome area over the next number of weeks. If you have any uncertainty about that, please speak to myself or John Gillespie, one of the elders, and we will make sure that, uh, that we explain that to you. We understand that the rules are a wee bit complicated, um, but we want to adhere to them and we want you to understand them clearly. Again, so that everybody who is entitled to vote is able to vote. Uh, and those uh, who are not sure get the clarity that they need. Those who are maybe mistaken in their understanding get the correction that they need all in good time so that when the election of a new minister um, takes place, everybody who is eligible to vote uh, is able to vote. So we're just letting you know that this is all underway. So watch out for that over these next few weeks and listen to the announcements, read the announcement sheet if you're looking for clarity. And if you need more clarity than that, please don't hesitate uh, to speak to us. We want this to be very open, transparent and encouraging for all members of the congregation. So that's a new voters list, which is currently in the process of being prepared. And the second thing uh, that I want to say to you today is that um, we're now in the process of looking for potential ministers uh, for Port Roche. And it's the responsibility of the Kirk Session to, to draw up a list of properly qualified ministers who may be possible candidates to fill the vacancy here in Port Roche. And so an opportunity is given to all members of the congregation to suggest potential ministers uh, to the Kirk Session for their consideration. So if you think you know a minister who could do a really good job here in Port Rouge and you've been praying about that and considering that, please bring the name uh, to myself or via John Gillespie to me um, so that we're able to bring that before the Kirk Session uh, so that they can give consideration to potential new ministers uh, here in Port Rouge. If you want to suggest a minister, you need to do that in writing um, and you need to sign your name on a little bit of paper where you, um, where you share the name of one minister, but possibly more than one. Uh, we're not looking for you to submit a roll of wallpaper with every minister's name that you can think of. We're looking for you to do this uh, prayerfully and carefully and thoughtfully. But if you think there may be one or two ministers who might do a really good job here in Portrush, that might be the person that God is calling here, then make that name known to us. And you have to do that in writing uh, by the 28th of April. So uh, you've got this week and next week. I'm sure you've already been thinking about that and you have some possibilities in mind. If that's the case, then let us know. The timetable for moving on from here um, uh, is quite challenging in two respects. Uh, it's challenging to have ministers to preach here in the congregation before the summer. If that were possible, that would be ideal and we would try to do that. And we're looking toward that possibility but we're beginning to suspect that that might be too tight a timetable um, and we may be conducting the process and then in inviting ministers um, to, to, to be heard in September. As this clarifies over the next week or two, we let you know how it's shaping up. But at the moment, what we want you to know is the process is underway, we're organizing the voters list and we're also looking for names of potential new ministers for Port Rouge from yourself. If you have any questions about that, I suspect that you'll have loads of questions and that's great because at least you're interested. So don't be afraid to come and speak to me, speak to John Gillespie or to one of the elders and we will do our best uh, to, to uh, share what wisdom we have with you. Please can I encourage you to take this seriously. I probably don't need to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I want to encourage you to take this seriously. We can't just assume that everything will just work out okay. That's not what scripture calls us to do. It calls us to trust in the Lord who's sovereign and to respond with wisdom and prayerful dependence on his sovereignty. So we know that God is at work, but he calls us then to wait on him, to pray to him that his will would be done, that we would have understanding, that the elders as a group would have wisdom 
in making important choices. And that you as an individual might think about who you would possibly suggest uh, as a potential new minister. So please be praying about this. Be taking it very, very seriously. And be chatting to the people around you uh, in terms of developing your understanding and, and listening to what other people have to say. So I know that's been very involved. Um, I've given you the short, easy version. This is uh, calling a new minister for dummies. It's trickier than that when you get into the code, but the code is available. Uh, it's on PCI's website, uh, and you can have a look at that, and it outlines all the, the, the steps that are in place, uh, steps that have been developed out of a couple of hundred years of experience. Um, so it is a wee bit complicated, but it's carefully thought out and carefully arranged. You can get more information through the code, but if you're looking for an explanation of that, come and speak to us. We'd be glad to help you. Now, if you're still with me, that's the announcement's finished, and we're getting to the serious bit today. We've come to worship the Lord together. So we want to focus our attention on Him. We want to still our hearts in His presence. We want to be aware that we gather in the presence of the King of Kings. We're going to worship Him. Turn our hearts to him, open up our minds to him, listen to him as he speaks through his word. Paul, writing uh, to the church in Philippi, uh, says this about the Lord Jesus. God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We come to worship our Savior Jesus and we're going to sing Jesus, your name. Let's stand and we'll worship God. We continue to worship the Lord together as we unite in prayer. Let's all pray. 
God, our Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to worship you. And we rejoice in the gift of your Son to be our Savior. Lord Jesus, we worship you, Prince of Peace, Counselor, Mighty God. You, Lord, are the all-powerful King who rules in love. And as we come this morning, Lord, we gladly bow the knee to you. You're a good and gracious King. Lord, you're the one who creates the conditions for peace by your death on the cross. You're the Holy One who laid down your life for sinners. You're the one who stood in our place, our substitute, our burden bearer. And Lord Jesus, we look, uh, uh, look to you to take the blame for our sin. You're the one who sets us free from the shame uh, and guilt of our sin. Lord, because of you, we are now reconciled and brought near as we trust in you and hold on to you. Lord, we're friends of God now rather than enemy, enemies because of what you, Jesus, the friend of sinners, have done for us. Lord, you have done for us what we could never have done for ourselves. And so we come gladly. We come with thanksgiving in our hearts. We come rejoicing in what you've done. And Lord, in the midst of the storms and the strivings of our troubled world, your peace quiets our soul and enables us to find rest. In these moments when it looks as if the world's about to burst into flames uh, through uh, challenges and difficulties in the Middle East, you're the one who restores our peace. You're the one who gives us hope. You're the one who quiets our soul in the midst of uncertainty and fear. Lord, we thank you for your strength and courage, your presence and help with us, help for us. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd steady our nerve, that you'd enable our service for you, and that you would draw forth from us the love that you've given to us so that we might share it with others. Lord Jesus, yours is the name that's above every name, and yours is the name that one day all nations and all peoples will praise. Forgive us, Lord, that we so easily forget, so easily undervalue, so easily turn away from all that you are and all that you've done for us. Lord, we confess today that so often we go our own way, and we go in our own strength, and we go to pursue our own glory. Lord, we confess that we've dishonored you. We've brought shame on your name as well as on ourselves. And so we pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us for our arrogance. Forgive us for our disobedience. Forgive us for our lack of trust. Forgive us for our unwillingness to follow where you lead. Come afresh upon us by your Spirit. And change our hearts, Lord, so that we love you more and more. And so that we grow to love what you love more and more. Fill us afresh this morning with your Holy Spirit. So that we might go out from this place and live for your glory. And to serve you. And we ask in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Boys and girls, if you want to come down to the front, uh, Josh is going to come and speak to you. Josh, we're really delighted that you're able to help us in worship this morning. Uh, and we're continuing to pray for you and Megan on your journey. Um, thank you for coming to help out today. Good morning. How are we all this morning? Good. You're all glad to be back to school after your two weeks off? No, there's only one person saying yes, so Megan, I'm glad to see you're happy at being back at school. <laughs> come on down, come on over, I'm not going to bite, come on over, you can come on over into the middle. Good, good. Now this morning, I want to talk to you about one of the ways Jesus describes himself in John's gospel. And in John's gospel, Jesus describes himself seven ways, using what we call the I am statements, okay? And this morning we're going to look at one of them. But I was a wee bit silly and I have lost the props that I brought with me to use. But I'm very fortunate, somebody very quickly was able to draw me up a map. Where is this map of? Can anybody guess? Yes, Megan? Yes, it's a map of the church. So you can see there's John standing up at the pulpit. 
There we have the praise band over here to this side. There you have Alison and Stephen on the sound desk at the back. And then you have everybody else in the congregation. And there in the star, it says, you're here, where we're sitting right now. Now, first of all, I'm going to need a volunteer. Who wants to come up and help me? Yes, Megan, do you want to come up and help me? So we'll look at the screen. And what is the first item that we're going to find? Let's see. Well, One more again, I think. Yeah. What's that we're trying to find? A compass. A compass? Yeah. Now, from looking at the map, where do you think the compass is? Is it over here at the front? Yeah, it's at the back. Do you want to go down and see if you can find it at the back? Yeah. You find it okay? Good girl, thank you. Brilliant. Now, do you know what you use a compass for? Does anybody know? Yes? Yes, which way to go? You use it for directions. And you would use a compass along with a map whenever you're out walking. Walking through the mountains where it's very dangerous and you could very easily get lost. But whenever you use a compass and a map together, it will keep you away from danger and keep you safe. And this morning we're looking at when Jesus says, I am the way. And when Jesus says, I am the way, what he means is that whenever we ask him to come into our lives, he will come alongside us and he will guide us and show us the way on how to be with him in heaven. Now I need another helper for the next one. Lucy, do you want to come on up? Now, let's see what the second item is. What's that? Bible. It's the Bible. Now, where do you think the Bible is in the church? Now, this is a special Bible. It's not like the ones that are in the pew. It's got a picture of a lion in the front of it. But where do you think in the church it is? Over there somewhere. Do you want to go and have a wee look? See if you can find it. I think it may have fallen down from where it was propped up on. <laughs> Yeah, that's it up there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Yes. So Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth. And you see, throughout the whole Bible, right from Genesis, we read of a promised Savior. A Savior who will come and save us of all the wrong things that we have done so that we can have everlasting life in heaven. And what Jesus is saying is, I am the truth that you have heard about, you have read about throughout the whole Bible. I am the promised Savior who is here with you all. Now, I have one more item. Who wants to come up and give me a hand for the last one? Yeah, do you want to come on up? Perfect. Now, the last item we have to find. What is it? Up in the top corner. Anybody else remember the name of it? Yeah? Yeah, so we first aid bag. Yeah. Now, from looking at the map, whereabouts is it in the church? Do you think it's over in that corner? I can see you looking over in it. Yeah? Do you want to go and see if you can find it over there? Yeah, go up over down the ramp. Yeah? Good man. Good man. Now, can anybody tell me what we use a first aid bag for? Yes? Yeah. So whenever you're at school, you're out in the playground and you fall and you cut your knee or you hurt your hand, you go into your teacher. They should have one of these in their classroom. And inside, we have wee wipes to help clean your cup. And then we have some plasters that you can put on over it. And this reminds me of what Jesus says when he says, I am the life. Now, what Jesus is talking about is not a physical pain that we have on the outside, 
boy. He's talking about is a pain that we all have in our own hearts. Because we all have sin in our lives. And it means we cannot be with him in heaven. But you see, the great thing is when Jesus says in John 14, up on the screen, yeah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus is saying is, I am the way. I will show you how to get to heaven, to be with me and my Father. I am the truth that we read in the Word. And I am the life. I'm the only one who can save you. That's why Jesus came to earth, to die on the cross for you and for me, so that we can be with the Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you love us, that you love us so much that you sent your only son to earth to die for each one of us, even though we did not deserve it. And Father, we thank you that Jesus will come alongside us and show us the way to be with you. And we ask that you will speak to each one of us about this truth. Amen. Now we're going to stand and sing your hymn this morning. And then you can take a wee seat at the front after. I think there might be a lost verse somewhere that tells us about, uh, encourages us to build our houses uh, on, the, on the rock rather than the sand, isn't that right? We'll maybe sing that next time around. Okay. Josh, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. If you want to go into the second row there, guys, you can get a seat in there. Okay. Can you manage? I think go into the next row. Uh, it'd be far easier. In you go. Good lad. Well done. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for participating so well with Josh. You're a really responsive crowd. Absolutely brilliant, you guys. And we're going to read together from God's Word. Josh was talking about this being the truth, um, and it's full of truth that enables us to find life in all its fullness. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 13, and we're beginning to read at verse 44. Matthew chapter 13. And we're beginning to read at verse 44. Jesus is teaching people uh, who he is, what he's come to do, and how they should respond to him. Uh, and he often uses stories. Anybody know what those stories are called? Parables, is that right? What would you call them? Parables, good man. So he uses stories called parables to help us to understand. And we're going to read a couple of those parables now. Let us hear the word of God. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man find, found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad fish away. 
And this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understand all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who's been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Amen. And we ask God to bless the reading of his word. We're going to bring our morning offering. Your offering will now be received. We're going to sing as the offerings collected the goodness of God. Let's keep our seats and sing the goodness of God. I think we're obviously still working on that one. That's a, a jewel growing in delight as we polish it. Um, we'll sing it a few more times in due course. You, you'll soon get the hang of it. Boys and girls, you're going to go off to Sunday school now. It's been great to have you with us this morning. Okay, 
We're going to join together now in our prayers for others. We're coming at a very difficult situation um, at, in this moment in history with so much potential for disaster. Uh, and so we come seeking grace and help from one who is able. Uh, let's unite our hearts in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we come with fearful hearts as we uh, respond to the news on our, on, on our TV sets, uh, news of an Iranian attack on Israel. We recognize the potential for a huge escalation of the trouble in the Middle East, an escalation that could lead to the loss of thousands more lives and could spread beyond the Middle East. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would grant wisdom and understanding and level heads to those people in positions of responsibility and power. We pray, O oh God, that you'd help them to think beyond the immediate needs of the moment to think beyond their own sectional interests and national interests, to have an awareness of the potential for even greater tragedy than we've seen already. We pray that you'd grant wisdom and success to those who want to promote peace and understanding and normal coexistence. We pray, O oh God, for those firebrands who want to create more havoc, that you would still their, 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 their voices, that you would uh, quieten their hearts, that you would um, make their arguments ineffective. We pray for cool heads in the corridors of power. We pray for wise responses. We pray for an ability to think beyond the moment. Father, we acknowledge that all of us, including our leaders, are sinners. And we fall easily into sin. And we act quickly at times without thinking. And we give in to our base of motivations. Grant power today and in these coming days. That, re that temptation might be resisted. That the paths of peace might be valued and followed. And we pray, O oh God, that this current crisis wouldn't escalate into something far worse. Act in mighty power, we pray, to promote peace. And Father, we pray for all those who've been caught up in the, the conflict in the Middle East, uh, particularly in Gaza, uh, in these uh, last few months. We pray for many families grieving in Israel and in Gaza. We pray for the families of the hostages who've been through such torment in these past months. We pray, O oh God, for those who've been wounded in the fighting for those who've been traumatized by things they've seen and experienced. Pray for those who've been bereaved. We pray for those who've been displaced, whose lives have been turned upside down in a way they could never have imagined. And we ask, O oh God, that you would prosper the efforts of those who are seeking to bring peace into this situation and stability and, uh, and a, a, a response that leads to normal living in due course. We ask, oh God, that you would come in your infinite power into this situation and work in ways that we can't even imagine to bring healing and reconciliation and restoration. We pray for the conflict in Ukraine, which is less visible on our screens these days, but no less deadly and damaging. We pray, O oh God, for all those who've been injured mentally and physically in, in, in the fighting there, asking that you would come to their aid, provide relief and healing and help. We pray for thousands of people who've been bereaved in, in terrible situations and ask that you'd comfort them and be their consolation. 
We pray again for those who are seeking to promote peace. We pray that you'd prosper their efforts too. We pray that you'd um, help them to begin to uh, see a way forward. Pray that you would act in the circumstances to create a climate, a potential for a peaceful resolution. We pray for all those who are seeking to bring aid into those situations, who put their own lives at risk for the good of others. To ask that you'd protect them and keep them safe and that you'd use them uh, as they bring in food and water and medical supplies. Um, we pray for your church in the Middle East and in Ukraine and in Russia. And to ask, oh God, that you would speak through your church that eternal word that, that gives a firm foundation. We pray, oh God, that your people would listen to your word and be guided by it and remain obedient to it. We pray for your church uh, as individuals speak out um, the gospel hope and the need for reconciliation and forgiveness. We pray that you'd empower the message that alone can bring a future into these difficult situations. Well, we pray for the International Meeting House, a Presbyterian uh, initiative in Belfast that seeks to uh, provide a point of contact for refugees coming into Northern Ireland to provide a gospel environment and a gospel message uh, and a gospel love. We pray for those in leadership that you guide them and strengthen them and help them in these days. We pray for the prayer meeting uh, of Iranian refugees coming together today uh, to call on your name for help. We ask, oh God, that you'd hear their prayers that you'd gather them together um, and enable them to find comfort in one another and uh, in the context uh, that the International Meeting House provides. Lord, give comfort, give reassurance, provide support and help and hear those heartfelt cries for peace. Father, we pray for uh, Ron and, and Frida Medcalf today uh, as they grieve the loss of Ron's brother, uh, Doug. We ask that you'd come alongside them to comfort them and to encourage them and to help them. We pray for all who are grieving this morning, a recent loss or a loss going back years that's still hard to bear. We ask, oh God, that you'd put your loving arms around them and that you'd console them and help them. Pray for Josh and Megan as they continue their journey, uh, trying to respond to your call uh, on their lives. Uh, Father, we pray that you would encourage them, that you'd help them and support them, and that they might find hope in you and rest in you and direction and guidance from you. Father, we recognize that you'd increase their faith as they hold on to you on that journey, which is uh, uh, at times a bit of a roller coaster ride. Pray that when things are challenging and difficult, that they might know that you're the sovereign Lord uh, who controls their path. Uh, when things are going well and they're rejoicing, we pray that they'd return thanks to you. Uh, we thank you for their ministry and we pray that you'd bless it and that you would grow it and that you'd make a place for it in due course. So we trust them into your care and pray all our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We're thinking about Matthew chapter 13 and, and uh, principally the, the, the parable of the um, buried treasure. So if you want to have that open in front of you, you can keep a, a note on where we're going with this. Uh, when I was a wee boy, starting to feel like a long, long time ago now, although you wouldn't realize that looking at my lovely face, when I was a wee, wee boy, I have a, I have a vivid memory um, of a time, this was before I even started school, so I've got an amazing memory. I was holding hands with my mum, and we were walking around the Bloomfield Road in East Belfast. I don't know if you know where that is. Uh, it's where we grew up. And uh, I was walking along, holding her hand, and uh, my mum stopped, and I was kind of jerked to a stop, and she bent over, and she picked something off the ground, and she held it out to me. It was a five-pound note which was astounding to me and probably to her too. This was back in the early 60s when a five pound note wasn't something that you could give or take. It didn't matter. It was a significant amount of money. And for us in our family, where there wasn't a whole lot of money around, it was an amazing thing. Um, my mom found this note. Her, her face lit up. Her eyes were sparkling. There was a smile on her face. You couldn't have beat off with a stick. It was amazing. Uh, and she took me in. There was a wee clothes shop there, and she took me into the wee clothes shop uh, just at the top of Bloomfield Avenue, and she bought me a wee, a wee pair of white gutties. Anybody know what gutties are? 
Yeah, you know, white gutties and a wee pair of jeans. I thought I was the bee's knees. New jeans and white gutties. And that night, we had a fish supper for our tea. The glory days, as I remember them. It was an amazing thing to find a five pound note. A while back there, I uh, was, was ill and was getting some treatment, and it was a pretty low time for us uh, in our family and for me in my own personal experience. And uh, I was at hospital getting some treatment, and when I came out, Lynn said to me, you'll never guess what. And I said, you're probably right. <laughs> what? She said, I have just won uh, a quiz on U105, and we've got tickets to go and see Van Morrison down in Dublin. So my eyes lit up because I love Van Morrison. And although it wasn't in the best of form, I was really looking forward to this amazing thing that had been given to us. Lynn had been sitting in the car just marking time. The quiz came on the radio and she texted in and won. And we had an amazing weekend down in Dublin watching Van Morrison. I think we all... I've had some experience in our lives, haven't we, of finding something really valuable, something that, that made our eyes light up. I suspect that's why some of us watch uh, Antiques Roadshow. It can't be because we like looking at plates. That can't be it. It can't be that we're interested in dirty old or ornaments that, that should have been thrown out of the, the, the roof space into the skip long ago. I suspect it's because there's always the possibility that somebody's going to bring this old thing that should, that should have gone in the skip but turns out to be worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, or maybe even just thousands and thousands of pounds. You know that experience, somebody brings this whole thing around and, and you wouldn't give tuppence for it, and it turns out to be worth thousands of pounds. And you can see the wee woman's eyes light up and the face come to her smiling, and she fakes being kind of unperturbed and pretends, oh really, thousands of pounds, that's not lovely. Uh, of course, our darker side, also loves those moments when, when, when somebody comes with their prized possession, expecting to be told that it's worth thousands of pounds, only to discover that it's not worth tuppence helping it. And there's a dark side of us that takes a, a, a perverse pleasure in that too. I think the Antiques Roach was all about that idea of, of the surprise find, something that kind of just makes us waken up, makes our eyes light up, makes our, 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 our face shine. And that's what Jesus' story is about, this, this little parable of the man who finds treasure uh, in the field. And the first thing I want to say to you is uh, that we're looking here at a, a breathtaking discovery, a breathtaking discovery. Uh, there's a man finds treasure, buried treasure in his field, uh, and his life is turned around because of his find. When I was a wee boy growing up in East Belfast, I used to dream about finding parrot treasure. Uh, and it was probably a pretty unlikely scenario. There, there are not many places down Bloomfield Avenue where parrots have bur buried treasure. But it was one of my dreams, you know, reading those books when you're a kid, parrot treasure, treasure eyes, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I would think, maybe wouldn't it be amazing if that ever happened? Very unlikely. Not so unlikely that you would come across buried treasure in first century Palestine. That, that, that wasn't a, a particularly unusual or unlikely event because it was quite normal for people in those days to bury their valuables when they felt under threat. Uh, there, there weren't banks that you could take your, your, your valuables to uh, and, and, and Israel's situation meant that armies were always coming and going through Israel. It was at a kind of a crossroads in the Middle East and there were always invading armies coming from somewhere and going to somewhere else. And if you had any buried treasures or if you had any treasures at all, if you had any sense, you would bury them because the passing armies would undoubtedly uh, loot and, 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 and steal anything worth taking. There were plenty of wars happening, plenty of armors coming through. There were marauding bands of raiders who would come down in the village and they would take all the, 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 uh, the, the crops and they would take anything else of valuable and they might carry off some of the women as well. That was, that was day and daily. Well, not day and daily. It was, it was typical. It was typical. And so burying uh, your valuables at particular times was not an outlandish thing in the way it might seem uh, today. And of course, it wasn't unlikely then that um, someone who had buried their valuables might die or, or be killed in the circumstances of, of, of the unstable circumstances of the time. And so buried treasure, uh, buried valuables would stay buried uh, in the places where they'd been secreted. And perhaps for years and years, there would be undiscovered valuables. And so Jesus calls us to imagine the scene. There's a man out working in the fields. He's 
going along. Maybe he's praying. Maybe he's clearing stones away. Um, maybe he's getting ready to, to, to look after uh, uh, crops that are growing. And, and is he working? We're, we're going to imagine him playing. And he's playing a field and he's daydreaming. It's hot and, 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 and the sun's beating down and he's thinking about knocking off time. And, and as he goes along, all of a sudden, he hears a strange sound, a clunk as the plow hits something. He's curious as to what made the noise and what, what, what's going on, and so he begins to investigate. And as he gets down on his hands and knees, as he begins to brush away uh, the, 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 the dirt, um, he starts to get a wee bit excited because, I mean, he's heard of stories of buried treasure being found. And his mind immediately goes to the prospect of, of buried treasure being found. And, and he starts digging carefully, uh, and his mouth begins to get dry, and, uh, and then... He hits something solid. He brushes back the sand, discovers uh, a, 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 perhaps a chest or perhaps cloth, and he unwraps the cloth or he opens up uh, the buried treasure. And his eyes light up and a smile breaks out across his face as he discovers perhaps gold or silver coins or perhaps jewelry or items of great value. You can imagine his heart thumping. It's almost going to bounce out of his chest with the excitement of the discovery and the potential that this discovery has for the rest of his life. And you can imagine him looking over his shoulder to see if anybody else uh, is looking on. And then he does something that seems a bit strange to us. Instead of grabbing the treasure up and running off with it, he puts it back in the ground and he covers it up. And he does that because under the rabbinic law of the day, if he takes the treasure out of the, the ground and out of the field, then it belongs to the person who owns the field. So he might have discovered the treasure, but he would have to give the treasure up to the person who owns the field. He's not that daft. And so he covers the treasure over. He disguises the ground. He goes away and he gathers up everything he has that's worth anything, and he trades it in so that he can buy the field. Because then the field belongs to him, and so does the treasure. He's shrewd. He understands the situation. And he does what's necessary so that he is enriched by his amazing find. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like finding treasure. It's unimaginably exciting. It's the source of great joy. It's hugely, unbelievably enriching. The kingdom of heaven, being a part of the kingdom, is enriching in a way that you could hardly imagine. It's better than a lottery win. It's better than a five-pound note in 60s East Belfast. It's amazing. The kingdom of God is a source of great joy. Discovering the kingdom of God opens up the prospect of unimaginable joy. Well, hold on a minute. You might be thinking, uh, uh, some of you could be thinking, a source of great joy. I've been to some church services. I know some Christians. And to be honest, unimaginable joy is not the phrase that comes to mind. Hugely enriching experience is not what I would have thought of if you'd asked me to describe it. Sometimes church and sometimes church people are as dull as dishwater. Hard to stick. Not the kind of setup that you might want to be involved in. Life limiting rather than life enhancing might be your response. That was C.S. Lewis's experience. He, he looked at Christianity in a particular way before he was surprised by joy. That was the title of his of the account of his own conversion, surprised by joy. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, unimaginably enriching, a source of great joy and delight. To be in the kingdom of God is to be a citizen of God's kingdom. 
to live under the rule of God, to live under the protection of God, to live in the light of the provision of God, to live in the love of God. And not only for this life, but for all eternity. To be in the kingdom of God is to have God lavish his love on us, to pour out his grace into our lives, not treating as we deserve, but treating us according to his great mercy. It's to have God accept us just the way we are with all our faults and feelings, with all our personal history to this date. It's to have God forgive us for all our sins. One roll of wallpaper wouldn't be enough. Multiple sins day by day by day throughout our lives wiped clean, forgiven forever. Let's have God adopt us into his family so that we become his dearly loved children. The apple of his eye. It's for God to put his spirit in our hearts so that we are transformed from the inside out. So that through the working of his spirit in us, we grow to love him. And grow to love the people around us. And are changed in such a way that we actually become the kind of people God created us to be. No matter, no matter how unlikely that might seem at this moment in our personal experience. It's to enable us to live a life which glorifies God. Which makes him smile with joy. Which brings delight to his heart. What a prospect for people like you and me to be able to live in that way. It's for joy to lift the condemnation that we deserve off our shoulders so that we're set free and to have that condemnation laid on the shoulders of Jesus who dies in our place because of it. Instead of condemnation, joy and delight in our new status before God, in our new destiny, in the light of eternity. What an amazing transformation. What a, a gloriously enriching experience, which is ours because of Christ as we enter into the kingdom of God. And I've seen in practice the difference that that makes. I've seen it in people's lives as, as I've uh, lived my ministry in, in, in Bally Sally. Uh, people totally transformed, whose lives were going in a particular direction, turned right round, so that they're going in a completely new direction. People who are, who are burdened down and, and messed up, who, who are lifted onto their feet, uh, who, who are dusted down and, and who are given new opportunities. People who are gripped by addictions, set free to pursue a new kind of life. People with new hope, new attitudes, a new motivation inside, a, a new character developing before your eyes, a, a new uh, experience of behaviors that, 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 were, that were different, that were positive, that were new. People transformed. It's incredible to see it. I've seen it in my own life as a teenager, not interested in God, with no background in the church, going in a direction away from God and away from blessing and away from wholeness and fullness. And God intervening in my life in an unusual way. I got into trouble with the police. I had a couple of court appearances. And I was sentenced to church. The judge said to my parents, you need to get that boy off the street. Send him to church youth clubs. Send him to the boys' brigade. And as a result, I was sent to the boys' brigade and the scouts and the, church, uh, the youth club and the congregational church, the youth club and the Church of Ireland church, the youth club and the Presbyterian church. I wasn't sent to the youth club in the, in the Roman Catholic church. I'm not sure why. <laughs> sentenced to church, but the impact of that sentence was a changed heart and a changed life. Because I began to hear the Bible being taught. I met people who were genuine Christians. I had a stereotypical view of what a Christian was and a not particularly attractive uh, view of, of Christianity. And when I met real Christians, genuine people, 
My, my attitude was changed. My understanding was changed. As I heard the Bible taught, my heart was changed. And the Spirit of God came in and took a wee boy who was rushing headlong to disaster and turned his life around and pointed it in a direction that was much more fulsome and wholesome. I've still been a bit of a disaster. If you know me, you know all about that. But I'm different. I'm different because of God's grace. My understanding of my life is that it's hugely richer than it ever would have been. And I have an eternity to look forward to where there's fullness of joy in God's presence forevermore. To be a part of the kingdom of God, to live with Jesus as Savior and Lord is a hugely enriching experience and holds forth an unbelievably rich destiny in eternity. I've met people who have been changed and I've met people who haven't experienced the love of God in the way that, that, it's, that I've experienced it and others have experienced it. I've met people who have resisted God, had no time for him, no interest in him. I've been with them in crisis moments in their lives and they've got nowhere to turn, no one to turn to. I've met them in the last days of their lives when there was no prospect of a future, when they had no hope. To be in the kingdom of God is to discover the source of joy, great joy, unimaginable joy. And I would commend it to you. Charles Wesley describes uh, the, the, his experience of amazement and wonder and delight in his, in his famous hymn, Man Can It Be. Listen to what he says after he came to faith in Christ. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed with righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Wesley experienced the joy of finding treasure that transformed him in a situation. Finally and quickly, this wee parable highlights a need for decisive action. Some of us are ditherers. I'm a bit of a dither myself sometimes. Come from a long line of ditherers. Not sure, will we get that coat or get that coat? I'd love to have both of them, but you have to choose. Of all of the brilliant cars available at the minute, which one are we going to go for? My daughter has inherited my genes, unfortunately. I can remember her when she was a wee girl, taking her into the garage to buy her sweets. Okay, darling, what would you like? And she would go up the line of sweets and down the line of sweets. And she would think, and she would go to, and, uh, um, and, she, and then she would get one and we would go up to the till. I say, right, one, two, three, and then we're buying something and we're going. One, two, she grabs something and we're going off to the till. And on the way to the till, she'd turn back and swap it for something else. Th th some of us are a bit like that, aren't we? We, we? we struggle to make a decision. But this man in Jesus' story is decisive. He knows a good thing when he sees it. And he acts immediately and decisively. He takes all he has and exchanges it so that he can buy the field. It's good to know about Jesus. Good to know that he's the son of God. Good to know that he's the savior of all those who put their hope in him. It's good to know that he is able to make available to us forgiveness and eternal life. But knowing that is not enough. To simply know it and do nothing about it, is to discover buried treasure and then cover it over and just go away. Not go away and buy the field, but just go away and leave the treasure lying there. And so many of us do that. It seems crazy to me. And yet it's my experience in discussion with people, people who believe what the Bible says about Jesus, but who don't personally respond in the light of what they know. You and me, we have to personally ask Jesus to be our Savior. We must personally trust in Christ's death in our place for our forgiveness, to provide us with righteousness, to make us acceptable to God. And you and I must surrender the control of our lives to Jesus. 
We receive Jesus as Savior who washes us clean, but also as Lord who directs our path. And he's Savior and Lord. He's not just Savior. He's Savior and Lord. And we respond to him as Savior and Lord, not just as Savior. I met lots of men in Bally Sally over the years. And when they hear the gospel story of one who will love them no matter what they've done, who will forgive them no matter what they've done, who will accept them just as they are, they want a Savior. But as they begin to understand that that Savior must also be Lord in their lives, you can see the wheels begin to turn. And you can see the enthusiasm begin to dissipate. They want a Savior, but they're not at all interested in a Lord who will direct their path, who will tell them what to do, who will be the boss in their lives. And I've come across so many people who are longing for salvation, but not at any price. This man in the field sees the potential of what's before him. He wants it for himself. And he goes out and does what it takes to make the treasure his own. Please see the value of the treasure as being worth far more than anything you would ever give up or miss out on or leave behind. There's a cost to being a Christian. But the cost to not being a Christian on the last day is far greater. There's a cost to being a Christian. But the value of being centered in the love and protection and care and provision of God blows that cost out of the water. It's not worth counting. The Apostle Paul said, I consider all things as rubbish compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's been my experience. That's been the experience of many people in this congregation. How do you respond? What do you think? Is being a member of the kingdom of God as enriching as I'm saying? Is it worth paying any cost for? I think so. But what about you? Perhaps Jesus is here by his spirit today and he's drawing you to himself. He's saying to you, this treasure is for you. Come and receive it as you put your hope and trust in me, as you turn away from sin and turn to me. Come and enter into the fullness that you were created to enjoy. As Jesus holds out his arms and says, come to me. What do you say? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your son to be our savior. And we thank you that in him, you've blessed us with every good and perfect gift. All that you have to give, you give to us in him. If we will receive him. Lord, if we hear you're speaking today, give us grace to understand and to respond with a wholehearted, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I want what you have to give. That was not to be put off. That was not to be distracted. That was not to count the sums up wrong when we're counting the cost against the blessing. Give us clarity of thought. Give us depth of insight. Give us faith to believe and to rise up and follow you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Faithful One, so unchanging. The one who offers his promises uh, is dependable. We can rely on him and trust him. Let's stand and we'll sing.
you've been thinking about what we've been talking about and you've got some questions, please don't hesitate to come and speak to me after the service or make contact with me during the week or speak to, to one of the elders here. These are important things and it's important to respond as you hear the Lord speak to you. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and remain with you forevermore. Amen.